It's so lovely to see you all. Thank you for being here. And thank you for joining us online too, if you're joining us in that uh, medium. My name's Malcolm, for those of you that don't know me. I lead the church here at Gold Hill, and it's my privilege to do that. You'll need a Bible uh, for uh, what I'm about to say so that you can follow in the scriptures with me some of the, um, some of the points that I would like to make. If you haven't brought one with you, the stewards will make one available for you now. We live in a rapidly changing society. And that certainly can breed anxiety and worry. Where is it all going to end? One of my mum's favourite phrases when she watched the news seems to be very apt. She'd look at me and say, Malcolm, what's the world coming to? Here in the United Kingdom, the triggering of Article 50 that signifies the UK's formal notification that we're leaving the European Union took place last Wednesday. The arguments and the bartering has already begun, with Scotland demanding a second independence referendum and the Spanish placing Gibraltar on the bargaining table and the UK government making clear that it will not be part of any negotiations. All these changes bring with them a heightened sense of uncertainty for men and women like you and me. The mudslide in Makoa that I've just prayed about has left at least 254 people dead, with 400 injured and 200 still missing. And our thoughts and our prayers are with those impacted by that. The terrible starvation in Eastern Africa that is happening at the moment. On a more individualistic level, men and women, perhaps some of you, struggle with the uncertainty of life for you. This week, I sat with one of the residents of Rock House, uh, the care home that we are connected with, for a few hours as he approached the last hours of his life. We were waiting for his family to arrive. And as I sat and prayed with him, I was reminded of the fragility of life. You and I do not get to call all the shots. What is the world coming to? Is a pretty apt question in the midst of uncertainty. And the more uncertain the world around us, the more likely we are to ask the question. Mark chapter 13 tells us the story of the disciples of Jesus at a time of rising uncertainty for them. And Jesus' response to them that can give them a road map for navigating the uncertainty that they face all around them. In the passage, Mark is drawing to the end of his story of Jesus' physical presence on the earth. By the time you reach this point, Jesus' confrontation with the religious leaders called the scribes and the Pharisees has been going on for a little while. One of the crunch moments is in Mark chapter 11, verse 11. Jesus walks into a temple, a huge building at the center of Jewish religious life, and he takes a look around it. And verse 11 says, Then he entered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. By the time you reach Mark 13, Jesus has been in public debate and discussion with the scribes and with the Pharisees. He's challenged their legalism their holier-than-thou approach to their Jewishness. He's exposed their double standards. If you like, he's taken a long look at the temple and at the leaders of the temple and at the religious life of Israel. Yet his followers are still impressed by the sheer stature of the building. As they leave it, we read this in Mark chapter 13, verse 1. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and buildings. Then Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. They then go to the Mount of Olives, which is just outside the city of Jerusalem. And from where it is situated, has a perfect view of this massive structure called the temple 
The place where they're sitting looked right over this array of buildings. They're not there anymore, although you can see the foundations and a door that's been blocked up so that any would-be Messiah couldn't get in. I remember going with my wife for, our 40th, for my 40th... Um, Debbie's older than me, just thought I'd mention that. For <laughs> my 40th birthday. And standing on that place and looking out over this enormous structure, or what would have been the structure. You can just see the foundations now. And Debbie's saying to me, no wonder they were intimidated. I mean, it is enormous. And as they look over it, Peter and James and John and Andrew come to Jesus in verse 4 of chapter 13. And they say, tell us, when will this be? When will this temple collapse? When will the stones be moved? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? There then follows in Mark chapter 13... Jesus explaining to his disciples why they don't need to be anxious. Why they don't need to be worried about what's going on around them or what's going to happen in the future. And stop for a minute and think about what he is saying and who he is speaking to. These followers of Jesus were desperate for the Roman authorities that had been controlling them for a long time by the time you get to around 30 AD to get out. They wanted political freedom and religious freedom and social freedom. They wanted intruders out. So they were desperate for Jesus, who they thought was going to establish a new political empire, to get rid of the Romans. So here, coming to the end of Jesus' ministry, political tensions are high. Relationships are strained. The scribes are out to get him. The knives are out. They say to Jesus, when are you going to do it? They asked a similar question in Acts chapter 1 verse 6 after Jesus had died and risen again. They said to him, is it now the time that you're going to establish your kingdom? They were desperate for it to happen. Jesus answers their questions in Mark chapter 13. And he gives them assurances. But he doesn't tell them necessarily what they want to hear. Take a look down the chapter with me. We're going to explore it a little bit. Look at verse 7. He says, When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Look at verse 13. After they've been attacked, he says, You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Look at verse 23. After he's given them further instruction about what's going to happen, he says, but be alert. I have already told you everything. Now look at verse 31. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Again and again, he says, you can trust me. I'm not out of control. I know what's happening. We can have Uncertainty without being frightened, according to verse 7. We can have conviction and determination in the face of not knowing what to do, according to verse 13. We can have wisdom and discernment, according to verse 23. And we can have faith and trust, according to verse 31. Jesus tells his disciples that God has not and will not abandon them. But he also reminds his disciples that the fundamental reason that they can trust him is that he will return. He's not going to leave them forever when he goes away. The cry of the Christian church for 2,000 years has been Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And the further away you get from that promise, the harder it can be to believe in it. These disciples were walking with the physical Jesus. He told them that he was going to die. He told them that he was going to suffer. He told them that he was going to rise again from the dead. But they needed assurance that he wasn't going to abandon them. The heart of Christian faith, Christian orthodoxy, for 2,000 years has been that Jesus Christ will return again to the earth. In Acts chapter 1 verse 11, the disciples see Jesus leaving and two angels, as they watch him disappear, turn to the disciples that are watching outside Jerusalem and they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up this same Jesus 
as you have seen go, will return in like manner. And for us, facing uncertainty, facing political uncertainty, social uncertainty, familial uncertainty, relational uncertainty, this promise has the same power if we will let it. But in, Acts, in Mark chapter 13, verse 6, Jesus answers his disciples by giving them guidance. He says these words, the end of verse 5 and then verse 6. Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. I want to take the rest of my time with you to unpack the rest of Mark chapter 13 to encourage you to remember who Christ is and the promises that he makes. When you look at those first few verses down to verse 8, you hear a whole series of things that Jesus tells these immediate disciples, the people that are living with him, the men and women around him that have been following him. This is who he's talking to at this point. Of course it applies to us also, but this is to them. And he says to them, there will be false prophets that will try to lead many astray in verse 6. There will be wars and rumors of wars in verse 7. There will be national conflict in verse 8. There will be earthquakes and famines in the same verse. He goes on to say in verses 9 to 14 that they themselves will face persecution. And that the good news will have to be preached to the ends of the earth before the end of time comes. In the 40 or 50 years after Jesus was physically on the earth, we can read of what happens in Jerusalem and Israel and Judea through the eyes of a number of people. But one interesting person is a man called Josephus. And he tells the story of prophet after prophet after prophet arising in Jewish tradition in the 10 or 20 years after Jesus was murdered, saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah. There were dozens of them. Just as Jesus said there would be. People promising that they were going to bring deliverance and freedom. And none of them did. There was conflict and war as the Roman Empire went through one of the most dangerous periods and difficult periods in its history. Everywhere you looked across the Middle East there was war and conflict. Wars and rumors of wars. Disasters and earthquakes around the world were taking place at this time. And Jesus says to them, don't be alarmed when you see that happening. It's the beginning of birth pangs. It's the beginning of the end of the age. Don't be frightened. We know from the New Testament's teaching that the, the end of the age in biblical understanding doesn't begin now. It began the day Jesus rose from the dead. Peter stands on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And he explains to the people that are in Jerusalem what's happening. And he says this, in these last days. The last chapter of history opened on the day that Jesus Christ died. It took a significant step forward on the day that he was resurrected. It took another huge step forward on the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out from heaven on the believers. And from that moment on, we have been living in the last days. The last season, the last epoch of time and history. Jesus says to his immediate disciples, don't be anxious when you hear this. When you see this happening, don't be worried. Of course, it's generationally true that year on year, generation after generation, we've seen wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines. We've also seen the outworking of this, haven't we? But we don't need to be anxious one of the most difficult days in my Christian faith was Boxing Day 2004. Not because it affected me personally, but because a quarter of a million people died in a single day in the tsunami. And I can remember saying, where is God in the midst of all of this? And then you begin to realize that we've been building houses on floodplains and putting people at risk without putting in defense systems for decades and decades as human beings. 
We've been putting them in places that we knew were dangerous. We've been cutting corners for years that we knew we shouldn't be cutting. We've been failing to install alarm systems and notification systems and all of those things. We live in the last days. But then in verses um, 9 through to 14, Jesus goes on to say to them that they're going to face persecution and they're not to be frightened. They're going to be hauled in front of courts. They're going to be told that they're liars and deceivers. Some of them are going to be attacked. They're not to be anxious. He also says, by the way, in verse 10, that the gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth before he returns. That still hasn't happened. But did you know that of the 12 apostles, Judas killed himself after he betrayed Jesus. Of the other 11, 10 of them were martyred. Only one died a natural death. That was John, who died as an old man in Ephesus. The other ten lived the reality of what Jesus said to them here. You'll be hauled in front of courts for me. You'll be attacked because of me. You'll be ridiculed because of me. You won't know what to say. But don't worry, because I will be with you. When we see the world changing, God is there. When we're accused, God is there. You and I haven't faced significant persecution for our faith yet. There are men and women that are in prison cells this morning, that are in container trucks, that are living in the backs of tents that are falling apart, that have lost everything and will not give up the name of Jesus Christ. I met some of them over the last couple of years hanging crosses from their cars in Iraq and in Syria and Iran, putting crosses on their arms in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, not ashamed of Jesus because they know that he is with them. Jesus encourages his followers in Mark 13 to remember that circumstances don't dictate his presence. He's there. He's always there. And it is true for us as well. We have to avoid unnecessary speculation and plotting and trying to work it all out when we think of Jesus' return. I've heard so many very odd sermons about this predicting dates. There was an, an Irish archbishop, you know, called Archbishop Usher, who worked out that the world began on the first week of April 4444 BC by working through all the dates and things. I'm not sure he was right, you know, but don't tell anybody I've told you. How many times have you heard preachers saying the world is going to come to an end on the 31st of December 1999? Or this date in May in 2012, or this date in 2008. Martin Luther did it. He predicted a date in the 1500s when Jesus would come back. He got it wrong, you know. You do know that. <laughs> the Jehovah's Witnesses believe Jesus returned um, in the middle of the First World War. And that he's taken people away already. They've got it wrong. I'm not sure Jesus wants you to try and work out the dates. I'm not sure he wants you to get out calendars and charts and plot moon lines and star lines and who's going to be king here and who's going to be king there. I think he wants you to have confidence that when he returns, you need to be ready. And you need to have this confidence that in the midst of all of the uncertainty of life, he's present with us. And that takes me to perhaps the most complicated section of Mark's gospel, let alone Mark 13. It's verses 14 through to 27. And I want to read it to you and then try to explain it so that you'll understand why I think it's so important. You're going to hear it and think, what on earth has this got to do with 2017? Can you please just miss this bit? No. Will you just bear with me? Will you give me 10 minutes of your undivided attention? Sharpen your mind. Sharpen your thinking. Take out a pen and a piece of paper for what I'm about to say and listen carefully. I just want to try and help you with this. Verse 14, Jesus says, But when you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, thank goodness that that's there, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Someone on the housetop must not go down or enter the house to take anything away. Someone in the field must not turn back to get a coat. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not be in winter. For in those days there will be suffering such as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now. No, and never will be. 
And if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he has cut short those days. And if anyone looks to you at that time and says, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False messiahs and false prophets will appear and produce signs and omens to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be alert. I've already told you everything. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven. And the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds. From the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn this lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That's a complicated passage. And it's made complicated because many of you have been taught that this is what it means. That at the end of time, all of this is going to happen. And that you're going to look and you're going to see the Son of Heaven coming in clouds and great glory. And at that moment, this promise will be fulfilled. I'm not sure that's what it means. Now let me explain to you why I'm not sure that's what it means. And then encourage you, because you're not far off, kind of. You have to go, first of all, to verse 30. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. If this, if this passage refers to the return of Jesus Christ in great power and glory, then Jesus got it wrong. Because he said, this generation will not pass away until these things happen. Jesus didn't get it wrong. So what's going on here? What is it that happened before this generation passed away that points to this? And why does it matter for us? Anybody like classical music? A few of you. I love classical music. If you listen to a really good symphony, in the first two or three minutes of the symphony, you're going to hear loads of undertones. And then throughout the rest of the symphony, you hear bits of that pulled back out and then explained and played in a different way. If, those of you that don't like classical music, if you think of, anybody remember the South Bank show? Dee, 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 that one? Well, that's the tune I remember. <laughs> um, that's a cello. And across um, the piece of music that was originally written, you can hear that same tune played in lots of different ways. To understand what Jesus is saying in Matthew, Mark chapter 13, you've got to understand that it's like a symphony of, the, of, of truth. Jesus takes verses that these people would be very, very familiar with because they were Jewish. They come from the book of Daniel and the book of Isaiah and he unpacks them for them so that they understand what's happening. But here's the important thing before I get to those passages themselves. Um, from 66 AD through to 70 AD, the Roman authorities were having real problems in um, Israel and in, in Jerusalem. They were also having real problems in their own empire. In that year, there were four different uh, emperors. Nero, who, was, who persecuted Christians in 65 AD, Otho, Vitellius, and Vespasian. Vespasian was on his way to be crowned as emperor in 70 AD. At the same time as Vespasian was on his way to be crowned emperor um, at, in 70 AD in Rome, his adopted son, um, Titius, uh, his adopted son, Titus, made his way, excuse the language, made his way into Jerusalem and ransacked the temple. At the same time as Vespasian was being crowned, his adopted son was ransacking the temple. 
Jerusalem had been under siege for years. And here's what happened when Jerusalem got under siege. Everybody ran. They ran to the hills. They ran to the villages. They ran to the fields. They ran away. They did what Jesus said was going to happen in Mark chapter 13. They said the end of the world has come. It's over. Everything's finished. This wasn't describing the end of the world. This was describing the end of their world. Everything was going wrong. It all looked as if it was going the wrong way. It was all going south. And Jesus said, and when that happens, do not be alarmed. Titus dismantled the temple. He pulled it apart brick by brick. He set it on fire. And then he pulled it apart brick by brick so that he could get the gold out of the cracks between the the bricks because there was so much wealth in the temple. The only thing that is now left is the foundations. They're still there. From AD 70, it's been impossible to prove in Jewish theology that you're the Messiah because the genealogical records are gone. It's impossible to get into the temple because it's not there. It's impossible to get through the door that used to be there because they bricked it up. From AD 70, there is no temple there anymore. What was Jesus doing? Why does that matter to you? What earthly difference does it make? Well, for that to be understood, we've got to look back at Daniel for a few moments. Jesus is quoting the book of Daniel here again and again. He quotes Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11. He also quotes Isaiah chapter 13 verse 10 and chapter 34 verse 4. But it's verse 24 of Mark 13 I want to take you to because this is the one that has been most misunderstood. When you see all of this happen, Jesus said to them, don't think I've lost You Don't think that it's all happening and there's no control. He says in the midst of the end of your world, there's something else going on. And then he says in verse 24 of Mark 13, In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great glory and power. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. I want you to go backwards to Daniel chapter 7 for a minute, because that's where this is taken from. It's so important that you understand what I'm trying to say to you. I know it's complicated. Here's where this is taken from. It's a section in Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 to 14 that's entitled judgment before the ancient one. That's God. Look at verse 13. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one. And was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. That shall not pass away. And his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. You've been taught, many of you, that what Mark 13 says is that Jesus will come this way in clouds and great glory. And that that's what that moment describes. Paul uses the same image about a different moment later in the New Testament. Here's what Jesus is teaching in Mark 13. Allow this to sink in. I'm sorry I keep moving this pulpit, but I'm getting excited about this. Here's what's happening in this section of the scriptures. It's really important you understand it. When Jesus was crucified, journey back with me to what happened when Jesus was crucified. Do you remember what happened in the temple? It it shook, right? And the veil in the middle of it split apart and the rocks shook we're told in the scripture that was the moment that the whole edifice began to crumble 40 years later when the Romans come in and destroy the building and take it, uh, take it apart brick by brick that's the last moment of this whole Jewish cultic system the temple isn't there anymore Nobody can worship at it. They can't sacrifice animals at it. They can't go to it. They can't visit it because it isn't there. And when that temple structure, that whole system finally collapses, something happens in heaven. 
Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is vindicated and presented to the ancient one who is his father. And the whole of the creation sees that this is the moment that this man who was Messiah is utterly and completely vindicated. And the old religious system of Judaism is no more. And you live in the power of that moment. You and I live in the power of that moment of vindication. And the apostles saw it. They lived through it. It was in their generation. It was in their period of time. Now the problem is that later on the apostle Paul takes the same language. To describe the moment when Jesus comes back again. And he says, uh, when he writes to the Thessalonians, he will come with the trumpet of God and with the voice of the archangel. And those who are dead in Christ will be caught up to, in the air. And those who remain will be caught up with him. And so we will be forever with the Lord. It's a different moment to this moment. This is the moment of vindication. This is the moment when the whole structure will shake and collapse and fall and be removed. And they will see it. And you live in its power. It's not at all doubtful about Jesus' return. He goes on to talk about it with great evidence. If you read Daniel closely, Jesus is presented to the ancient one as the one who has secured everything. You still live in its power. So when they see the worst thing happening in their lives, it is a moment where Jesus says, when you see the worst thing happening, there's something else happening in heaven that you can't see. When Jesus died on the cross, the world was seeing the worst thing happening in heaven. It was a different scene. When he was born, the world saw a child born in a stable with nothing. Heaven saw the king of all kings coming to earth. There's something else happens in the heavenlies when we see great things that are disastrous happening around us. We see one side of a story, but God has a bigger story. And you might look and say, I've seen X, Y, and Z happening in my life. It's a devastation. It might not be a devastation from heaven's perspective. God might be working out something incredible that you don't know about yet. Because he can't be defeated. You're allowed to get excited about that. <laughs> he is the Lord. And as the temple bricks were taken away. So they could get the gold from the plates. And the jugs. And the, um, and the coverings of the things that were in the temple. As Israel saw its very heart being ripped out. God was saying, your heart isn't being ripped out. I'm about something bigger. And then he goes into what we read in the rest of the chapter. This encouragement that we do not need to be afraid. The necessity of watchfulness from verse 32 to the end of the chapter is something that encourages us to remember that God will return. His son will come back. And when he comes back, we don't need to worry about the when. We just need to worry about whether or not we're ready. Are we living faithfully? People say to me often, when do you think Jesus is coming back? When he's ready. What should I do? Live as if it's tomorrow. Keep your house in order. Don't hold on to grudges. Be generous with your time and your money. Live your life as if it was your last day. Don't get anxious about the things that don't really matter. Remember that God is with you no matter what you're facing. Allow him to be glorified in the choices that you make, the relationships you form. And allow yourself to have the great hope that God is with us always. Keep awake and keep alert. I'm not a football fan. The ball's the wrong shape for me. But you could tell I'm not a football fan, couldn't you? Arsene Wenger, or Wenger, I don't know how you pronounce his name. Is that the guy that they sing about at the beginning of The Lion King? <laughs> Arsene Wenger. Anyway. <laughs> I thought that was funny, even if you don't. Is the long-time manager of Arsenal, I'm told. Are they a good football team? Oh, did somebody just hiss? <laughs> You're a Man City fan. Goodness sake. 
Is that, and he's, apparently he's under increasing pressure to quit his post. Because his team is consistently weaker in its performance in this season than it has been. In an interview yesterday that I looked at when I was preparing for today, um, the 67-year-old wasn't for quitting yet. He said, I will not retire. Retiring is for young people. For old people, retirement is dying. He went on to talk about what drives him. And he spoke of still being passionate about football. He said, I still watch every football game. I find it interesting. I'm as hungry as I've ever been. I carry a bit more pressure on my shoulders than 20 years ago, but the hunger is exactly the same. I hate defeat. He said, I understand the fans are unhappy with every defeat. But then listen to this. But the only way to have victory is to stick together with the fans and give absolutely everything until the end of the season. Because that's all we can do. The church has had too many defeats, I think, sometimes. We see things happening and we don't like them. We see things going wrong and we don't like it. We see decisions go against us. We see our society making decisions and we think, what do we do? We're mid-season and we're not winning. We seem to be losing more battles than we're winning. Here's what we do. As a local church and as the church of Jesus Christ, here's what we do. We stick together and we fight it out till the end of the season. And at the end of the season, it's not the hub heart home. That's just a building. It's not when we're full. It's not when we've planted churches. It's not all. None of that's the end of the season. Here's the end of the season. A moment in time and history when the clouds do part and the trumpet of God does sound and the Lord Jesus Christ does return and he takes all that we have done and he adds to it all that only he can do and the world is without sin and injustice is conquered and pain is removed and we are reunited with those who have gone in Christ before us and our lives are divested of the struggles of sin of the selfishness and the pride and the arrogance that holds on to us and we are forever with the Lord that's the end of the season and we hold on to it. We make a decision. What is the world coming to? Malcolm, I don't know what the world's coming to. Is how I began this sermon. Well, let me end it. I do. Here's what the world is coming to. A glorious moment when sin and death is eradicated forever. When every community is transformed and every nation calls on the name of the Lord and the glory of the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's the end of the story. And when we see political empires topple, we don't panic. When we see church denominations topple, we don't panic. When we see Christians martyred, we don't panic. When we see battles lost, we don't panic. When we see things going wrong in work and decisions made in courts that go against Christian values and ethos, we don't panic. Because we know the end of the story. What's the world coming to? An act of worship before our great God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can hold on to that with all that we are and all that we have. May God bless you with this great hope in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Our lives are so shaped by circumstances, Father. Remind us of your great grace and your great power. For every person here, for every person listening on the internet, remind us of your great power. There's nobody here retired. They may have been retired, equipped for a new season and a new chapter, but our lives mean something. As long as there's breath in our bodies, we have a purpose. Come by your spirit. For those who feel as if their world has fallen apart. Who face uncertainty at home, uncertainty in work, uncertainty politically, whether that's because of a boss that they can't get on with or pressures that are being placed upon them to do things that they can't do. For those people that I spoke to before this service, 
who are in education and are finding the demands of the um, school system hard. For those that are finding the demands of the NHS hard and are frustrated. Thank you that this church, this building, this gathering is not the center of our lives. You are, Lord Jesus. Help us to encourage one another to keep going. Help us to hold on to the great promise of God that you win. And that your son will return. And that history is not cyclical. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. And we know that we are on the winning side. For marriages that have struggled. For families that are broken. For finances that are falling apart. For mental health that is consuming people. For um, those that are living with loved ones with dementia. Or fear or anxiety. Lord Jesus Christ. Lift our eyes to you. And remind us of your great grace. And for those who have walked through the valley of the shadow of death too many times. We give you praise. It's not the end of the story. That even death doesn't get the last word. And we thank you that when the Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and broke it and he gave thanks. And he said that it was like his body that was broken for us. And that the wine that he drank was like his blood shed for us. And he invited us to eat and drink bread and wine to remember his death until he returns. As we eat this bread and drink this wine today, remind us of the great promise, the great hope. Your son will return. The vindicated one. And every eye will see him. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of your name. Thank you for the privilege of being able to do that now. Not forced but chosen. We confess his name. And we worship him. Amen.